next presentation is by Jake Everly from the University of North Carolina, and it's entitled Transmissibility, a mode of artistic research.
conceiving of transmissibility as an essential mode of artistic research, as a power of the future, as Deleuze tells us, shuttles us between aesthetic labor, meaning creation, research, performance, and cultural reception, for instance, exhibition, historiography, criticism. Following Deleuze and Guattari, the aim here is to conceive of artistic research as a twofold simultaneous operation. It deframes the present, meaning it undoes the actual discourse, precedent, received opinions, cliched feelings, and expressions. It deframes as it composes new lines and temporal languages, new becomings. This twofold simultaneous operation occurs because an artwork is not simply an object, but it is critical thought, a futural material force. This function of deframing and composing occurs in time, opening us to a multiplicity of temporal durations, the internal difference of time itself. And as such, it opens us to unforeseen, effective sentiments, material encounters that force us to think and to become. To sketch the broad outlines of transmissibility as a concept, I want to just focus on two aspects. One is problematic as style, and two is materiality as an event. Quote, the mode of the event is the problematic. Deleuze writes this in a logical sense. A problematic is what each artist is confronted with as she encounters artistic precedent and future demands, the desire for originality, newness, and difference at once. Problematics are the ideational and material conditions, the very state of things from which art thinks and creates. The entire critical language that Deleuze and Utari create to discuss artworks, singularities, sentiments, affects, and percepts is only understandable within the parameters of a specific problematic that a given painter, musician, writer, dancer, or filmmaker, or architect tries to solve creatively. We should add that by definition, a problematic is not answerable with a simple yes or no solution. A problematic is not a question. Rather, it's the act of surveying a section of an actual virtual imminent field where an art produces possible open-ended solutions that affirm chance and thereby remind us that thought and art are real, and as such disturb reality, morality, and the economy of the world. But one must know how to play this problematic game that Liz insists. One must know how to discern a problematic and create with and alongside it. If an artwork is an event, the infinitive verb of which is to transmit, then it must be involved in an ontological and aesthetic becoming that renders the real and new. But this ontological and aesthetic becoming takes place within a context, within a cross-section of the plane of composition. Because, quote, we can only speak of events only in the context of the problematic conditions they determine, end quote. It is this relation between a problematic and an event that I've been focusing on as I rethink our artistic research. In part, it is because it's quite difficult to explain how an event takes place within our practice. What I mean is that it's difficult to present artists, or artists in training, with the task of creating an event, especially since events and singularities are defined by Deleuze and Guattari as impersonal, non-subjective, becoming. Accepting this as, an, as the endgame of art's ontological and aesthetic value is easier to do if we can present artists with how to confront the actual state of things and teach them how to virtualize the actual. Converting the actual state of things as a plane of eminence requires one to create a problematic. We should begin here, especially by recalling that in all of his work on art, Deleuze defines originality or the new as, quote, precisely how problems are resolved differently, but most especially because an author figures out how to pose a problematic in a new way, end quote. Deleuze offers some sort of sober practical advice about what we're calling artistic research. One, begin with a concrete situation and work toward a problematic. A problematic here would be the threshold where an actual and virtual fold into one another. And two, conceive of artistic research as a mode of encounter. For the first, Deleuze insists time and again that artists should begin by confronting the actual state of things. He encourages beginning with extremely simple, concrete situations even before getting into problematics in full. He adds, quote, stick to the concrete and always return to it, end quote. 
This is because it's from perceptions and affections that percepts and affects will be created or extracted. This is the logic of empiricism, pluralism that runs throughout Deleuze's philosophy. Artistic research is nothing other than the search for the conditions under which something new is created. But the states of things must be understood neither as a given, nor as unities or totalities, but as multiplicities, as actual virtual patterns. Here's Deleuze on this point, a point that I sort of taken as the sort of starting point for rethinking artistic research. Bringing out the context, concepts that correspond to multiplicity means tracing the lines that form, determining the nature of these lines, and seeing how they overlap, connect, bifurcate, and avoid the points or not. These lines are variable becomings, distinguished from both unities and from the history in which these unities develop. Multiplicities are made of becomings without history, individuations without subjects. Empiricism is fundamentally connected to a logic of multiplicities. If we try to sort of unpack this passage um, simply and soberly, we have to start with simply saying that empiricism here at bottom means to experiment with experience. This appears to be the beginning of a method of artistic research. However, Deleuze will insist, and rightly so, that there is no simple, direct method, but only a long preparation and chance, two poles of what he calls an aesthetic encounter. So this gets us to the second point, an aesthetic encounter. Let's listen to Deleuze once more. When you work, he writes, you are necessarily in absolute solitude, but it is an extremely popular solitude, populated not with dreams, phantasms or plans, but with encounters. An encounter is perhaps the same thing as a becoming. You encounter people, and sometimes without knowing them, or ever having seen them, but also movements, ideas, events, entities. To encounter is to find, to capture, and to steal. But there is no method for finding other than a long preparation. We have to address why Deleuze claims here that there's no method. He is, he is hesitant to posit a method because any chance, because of the chance element of an encounter. He always insists that an encounter is clandestine, subterranean, fortuitous. But this should only turn us back to the notion of a long preparation. What does he mean by this? Immediately after these lines we've just read, Deleuze cites a poem by Bob Dylan that he very much admires. Then, taking the Dylan poem as a model of artistic production, he continues, quote, A very lengthy preparation, yet no method, no rules, no recipes, only having a bag into which I put everything I encounter, provided I am also in the bag. Finding, encountering, and stealing, instead of regulating, recognizing, and judging, end quote. For Deleuze, to encounter means multiplying and complicating the content of your problematic to the point of saturation, or even perhaps non-self. Recall when Deleuze cites Francis Bacon's statement that the canvas is never empty, but always replete with all the lines that have come before it. These lines are the materiality of the problematic. To encounter requires a material field of lines, the variable presence of the virtual past in the present. This allows for creative involution the simultaneous erasing and composing of lines, the bending and folding of lines to connect to other lines they've always avoided or missed. In this action, transmissibility becomes what allows becoming to unfold, a becoming that ensnares the work as much as the artist and the viewer, listener, or reader. Thus an act of erasing, simplifying, and involuting what one encounters motivates becoming which is a paradoxical movement because as one involves, explicating and complicating the folds of the work and oneself, one becomes more populated. Populated not with people or more things, but with singularities and non-historical temporalities. <clears throat> that is, the material and sensational precipitate of an event. And here's Douglas one last time. In becoming, there is no past nor future, not even present. There is no history. In becoming, it is rather a matter of involuting. It's neither regression nor progression. 
to become is to become more and more restrained, more and more simple, more and more deserted, and for that very reason, more populated. This is what's so difficult to explain. To what extent one should involute, because experimentation is involuted. This mode of creative involution is a connected thread running between Deleuze's work on Bergson to his concept of the fold. Becoming is a bit of time in its pure state, he says, or a section of chaos captured by a formal net articulated by an artist. The fold or the and of the Joycean chaos. All of us leaves us with the ability to posit that an artwork is what it does. It renders new passages, new modes of becoming between past and future. But these passages are always untimely because they are inherent, unhistorical lines of time flowing within the present. Transmissibility is the power of an artwork to deframe any cultural representation and to compose with other modes of culture. Transmissibility is this double movement, which creates aesthetic and historical encounters with singularities rather than subjects. Therefore, what is transmitted is not a given past or even a represented state of things or subjects. Instead, what is created is only an opening, a pure means a new temporal relation of simultaneity and duration, a past-future eye that inheres within the present, chronos, a relation comprised of incorporeal effects that make pre-individual and non-personal singularities sensible and intelligible. To think transmissibility in this manner is to accept Deleuze's philosophy of time and materiality. Deleuze's philosophy of time, of course, includes his elaboration of Bergson's theory that time is not simply divisible into past, present, and future. There are clear, no clearly differentiated temporal states, but only levels and degrees of temporal coexistence and transformation. Throughout his work, Deleuze relies on Bergson's concept of the pure past, that the entirety of all that has happened coexists with each present, that each present is thus the contraction of this pure past, which itself is then reconfigured with every passing present. The past, therefore, is an imminent terrain, a field, and not just a reified version of the present. This is because the past is searchable, explorable, problematizable, penetratable, and livable. The force that surveys and animates the past is the future. Temporal movement is always untimely for Deleuze and open because the future is the desire to search the past and make different presence look. It is the desire to actualize different configurations and effects in lieu of the present. For Deleuze, an event is nothing other than a movement of becoming that traverses time in it, <coughs> repeating and thus differentiating the succession of past, present, future, and new. Within this movement, the future does not, sorry, the future defines an event not in the time frame that it, it is in but in another time frame. Because this movement creates the forced communication of the present, past, and future within the same event. Of course, this forced communication has ontological, ethical, and epistemic effects, if only because it reveals how and why varying temporalities are unfolded within each supposed discrete text. However, the future has to be conceived as a disjunctive, aleatory force and outside that paradox that exists at the most intimate interior of time as such. Conceiving itself forces cracks, forces us to understand how the future forces cracks into the stable set of past events to exhibit not yet determined chance effects. Conversely, this forces the future to have shown itself in the past, at least darkly, and at least darkly in all of its precursors. Moreover, this philosophy of time makes Deleuze's assertion that art is a power of the future, that art is an invental force. This forces us to understand why he switches to singularities and temporalities that complicate the history of representation. When he argues that art comprehends the textures of matter, it's because he redefines matter so that the relation of matter and form in art is replaced by the relation of forces and forms. This operative function of an artwork presents artists, cultural historians, and philosophers with a challenge. 
the challenge is to cross threshold, thresholds of perception. This is Deleuze's great phrase from the fold that he repeats some 20 odd times. The challenge is to cross thresholds of perceptions and to peer into the crannies of matter in order to read the folds of the virtual. The aim being to encounter the texture of, the, of an event that is a life or pure eminence that traverses all matter. In other words, we need a sense of the affinity of matter with life. We must accept the challenge to, complicate, to contemplate how and why matter is already a matter of expression, and why what is expressed does not exist outside of its expressions. As Deleuze writes in the fold, art comprehends the textures of matter. That phrase relates to the great phrase in the cinema books where he says, give me a body then. Lastly, I want to sort of uh, leave us with the idea of, although there's no given method of artistic research, to let us simply lay out, uh, here's the method, here's the instructions, or the recipe, and simply follow them. There seems to be an ethic of this long preparation. And this long preparation seems to have a set of infinitive verbs to deframe and to, and to, and to compose, to transmit. Artistic research, then, is the very ethos of Deleuzean style, which is a non-style, a foreign language in the language we speak. But that non-style stretches our language to its internal limit, and thus towards the outside. Stretching the state of things and its representations means to creatively involve, to fold, to move toward an outside, an intimate exterior. This seems to be the double movement of becoming. Transmissibility as artistic research is thus a sober style, a texturology, a texturology that senses and creates temporal passages, involutions, and thus becomings. Transmissibility works to cross thresholds of perception in order to partake of the work of immanence. Thanks. Do you think that the problematic of the artist and the ideation of the, of the reception is problematised by new technologies and the instant framing, reframing of an artistic work almost before it's present to the audience? Exposure in some ways. It just seems like it does one half of the, of the equation. Right? 
and sort of exhibits or presents, um, but I don't really see if it deframes the sort of technological apparatus itself and then composes something new within it. So. It's not so much the technological apparatus, but the, 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 the problem of the mediation of, uh, of an a priori set of ideas about what's, what, what's happening within the work prior to the, the event of looking at the work, or the event in the work. Well, yeah. In, in that sense, um, yeah, if I, if I think it that way, sorry, I may have misunderstood the first time you posed the question. Um, the relationship between an event and its representations, or how it's mediated, right, becomes one of the crucial ideas, especially as I look at these things from history of culture and art as a historian. And it's, it's the sort of phrase that sort of I keep coming back to is, um, I think it's in the Thousand Pateaus, where De Deleuze talks about an event is something that's dated and keeps producing effects. Right? The way in which there's, there's some event which by definition cannot be represented, but continues to produce representational effects. So the event then becomes mediated to us through all these different things. But within those mediations, there still has to be some gap or opening for the event to become other, right? So there's that representational limit. And so I, I have been thinking that on the sort of historiographic side of this a lot. Um, the artistic side is, is, uh, is a little trickier for me, like this sort of relation of mediation I don't actually create artworks, I just see them through the historical work I do through criticism. This, that, that, that relationship of the event and then its, its mediation, its representational mediations, is, was really like the, the core that sort of like motivated a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have one really quick question and then uh, maybe more real question. Quick question was you quoted something saying, I didn't get exact quote or something like empiricism always deals with multiplicities. And I'm just wondering where that quote came from. Because uh, it's just useful to know. <laughs> but it's interesting. Um, uh, that's, um, that was in, the, that was in um, a letter that Deleuze wrote to. Uh, one of the translators of oh, Thousand okay. Kato's. Oh, okay. And I think in English, we, it's in uh, the Two Regimes of Madness to collect the collection. Okay. It's a really uh, fantastic letter that Deleuze writes trying to explain and unpack these uh, concepts. Uh, the, the question I would ask as well was um, talk about this idea of the long preparation. It's not interesting because it's so temporal, it's a long preparation, which kind of the strange thing is this, that this event that you're talking about seems n not temporally located. Mm -hmm. So the idea of waiting a long time for it, a long preparation for it, is quite an interesting one because it doesn't ever happen at one point in time. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what that means for the preparation to be long. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's there's sort of two things here. One, when I, when I sort of read that, it seems like at, at first we it did sort of suggest this. Which means that they're comfortable to sort of like this messianic structure of event. That you just wait and wait and wait, and then notice comes precisely when you no longer need it, right? Um, in the way that Agamemnon talks about uh, an event. Um, and a lot of this, a lot of this work actually came came about through um, uh, seemingly endless, uh, long, endless arguments with Agamemnon about this, and uh, all of which I lost. But so. <laughs> I'm winning now at every move. But um, the, the way, I, I, I think the, the, the long preparation goes, goes to that sort of double movement of simultaneity and duration. And the way in which, if we posit just the event as something to come, right, and, and, and we flirt with that sort of like linear messianic structure, then we move into a mode of transcendence. If the event has to be imminently unfolded with time, so in the way that it's disjunctive, right? But it's not a culmination, right? It's not a progression or regression. And I, and I think that the complications of that come only uh, in those discussions of whitehead and temporality in the fold. The way in which he talks about an event in the fold seems much more complicated than what comes before it. And I think because it runs into two things, temporal, temporal modulation, right? Again, thinking through the growth mediations and the representations of that, 
and in the way in which an event uh, that, that, that it sort of takes place through those passages, through the and, right? Between them. Sorry, that, that, that was leading to a more complicated thing. No, no, no. Thank you. And for one very quick question. Not, uh, thank you very much.